Well, I just want to welcome everybody back. Um, tonight, what we're going to do is we are going to cover chapter number two. I do have the learning objectives for tonight. I'm going to cover a couple reminders before we get started, but um, I've kind of already shared these, but this is what we should be getting out of the session and from reading this chapter. And I really think it comes down to like seeing and overviewing the entire workflow of how to develop a package. Observe the use of some common functions used in the package development workflow. So we're going to do a lot of stuff with dev tools and use this. Then we're going to understand the process to develop document and test a function. So we're going to kind of briefly like cover those, um, how we do those three things. Uh, and then we're going to describe the process to install and experiment with our package functions. And then I'm going to try a little bit to kind of sprinkle in Git and GitHub into this conversation at the start, maybe spend like 10 to 15 minutes with it. Um, you know, most people said they were pretty familiar with it, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I still think it's a good opportunity to present some things that you might be familiar with, you might not be familiar with. Um, and it's always good to kind of review it. And I'm also going to try tonight to show you some use of use this package functions that make working with Git a lot easier. And so I'm going to kind of discuss some of those um, and we'll go from there. So those are kind of the learning objectives. A couple reminders for tonight for the sessions, um, like we've discussed at the start, you know, if we do need to slow down at any time, just let me know. Um, I'm more than happy to, you know, uh, to have people tell me to, hey, I have a question or, hey, Colin, you got something wrong or, hey, Colin, I have a comment about it. More than happy for you to jump in. Just let me know. Just jump in at any time. Uh, also, the other thing is we are all here to learn, so don't be afraid to ask questions. If you have a question, more likely than not, someone else might have that same question. So really take this opportunity to butt in and, and ask questions because that's how we all learn. Camera is optional, but it's encouraged. Like we mentioned last time, I obviously want to respect your privacy and your comfort in these sessions, but you know, it's kind of nice to have a, a cohort where we can see and talk and kind of get the feedback. But again, it's encouraged, but it's optional. The other thing, just remember that the sessions are recorded. Uh, in fact, John, John uh, Harmon actually got the first um, video from last week up. So if you want to go review that, it's available to you, but just keep that in mind that they're recorded and uploaded to YouTube. And then the last thing that I have is John also put together the schedule and the sign up sheet uh, for people um, to sign up for uh, specific sessions that they want to present for. So I'm just going to open this up here real quick. Oh, that is the wrong link. Anyways, it is actually linked here in the Slack channel. So if you want to, you can find it here. There we go. It's popped up. I see that Rex has already selected for week number, uh, looks like for chapter number five, uh, fundamental development workflow. But if people are interested, uh, next week is definitely open. Um, but then there's other chapters that are available too. So if you have interest in a specific topic, this is a great place to uh, add your name and then I'll make sure to get with you to kind of get you set up to um, be a part of this and answer questions and do whatever I need to make your ability to present as seamless as possible. Once I kind of get some names and some finalize some people, then I'll switch over and add people to the official schedule on the repo for the actual uh, session materials and stuff. So, but this is your opportunity. It should be able to, you should be able to fill it in without having to have any permissions because I think it's shared with the public. So, all right, cool. Uh, so those are a few reminders. So let's kind of start our conversation for tonight. And the first thing that the book really talks about within chapter number two is the first thing that you need to get set up with is you need to get set up with these workflow tools. Uh, the tools that we're going to be discussing and using a lot pretty much throughout the entire book and throughout your entire package development process is a package called DevTools and a package called Use This. Now, what's really nice is, is that when you actually load or install dev tools and attach it it also loads in the use this package but just know those are two different packages that we're going to use different functions throughout the package development process and i'm going to monitor the chats oh sweet thanks ryan oh ryan's here is ryan here hey ryan i didn't see you jump in <laughs> cool awesome um 
Also, too, the other thing to take into consideration, if, if you're somebody that doesn't always, you know, update your packages, me, so I always do that sometimes. It's a good opportunity if you've already downloaded the, the dev tool pack, the dev tools packages to make sure that you're up to date on the latest version. Uh, you can check your version by running package version dev tools and make sure you're running 2.4.3. And I did check on GitHub to make sure that this was the most recent stable version on CRAN. And this should be the one that's on CRAN right now. And it's the one the book that's it's the one the book suggests you have to get ready and set up. So 2.4.3 is what you're going to need. Just make sure you're up to date on that. So the first thing that we're going to kind of discuss here a little bit is talking about what types of functions and tools are provided to us with the use of dev tools and the use this package. Um, these two packages provide for us different functions to help us fulfill specific needs during the package development process. And so a lot of the time, um, so some of the time what these packages provide us is packages that are used to facilitate the use of version control, which I'm going to show you a couple today that kind of blew me away. I was just like, whoa, this is kind of cool. Um, but to help you easily work with Git and GitHub. So if, if you're familiar with version control and you use like a GUI or a GUI client or you use the command line interface, there is an opportunity to do all of these same um, all the same like Git workflows right from the uh, R Studio console. And it kind of blew me away today. So I'm gonna share a couple of those with you. Uh, also, there are functions to assist in the package development process. And really what these packages provide us is they allow us to um, ease like the ability to set up the package structure for us. And so really what these functions really give us from the dev tools and the use this package is it takes away that kind of thinking process of like, oh, I have to put my file here, or I have to set up these two files, or I have to put this line of code in here to make this work. And so these functions really kind of streamline that workflow package or that the, the package development process. And, and, I, and as I've kind of grown developing packages and I'm not an expert on this, I found that these, these like workflow functions definitely help out. Uh, the other thing is, is that these functions help us develop documentation, uh, especially with the uh, powerful package called Roxygen 2. Roxygen 2, we'll talk about a little bit more about how we actually document our functions and document the ob objects within our package. Um, that's pretty much the package that does all of the work behind the scenes to develop all of our files for our um, documentation. It also helps us test or has functions to help us set up the testing framework while also being uh, creating some uh, having some functions to ease that kind of test development process for us. And then also there's some functions out there that help us create the readme.rmd file for documentation. So um, it's going to obviously if you're going to put this on GitHub or you're going to host it on some type of hosting service like GitHub, Bitbucket or um, What's the other one? Bitbucket and GitLab. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna use a readme.md file, but instead of doing that read readme.md file, you can use this readme.rmd file like we're used to, and then transition it or actually convert it over into a readme.md file, so that when it actually gets put on one of those hosting services, it automatically builds it for you. So, uh, so there's just a lot of convenience out of learning these these functions and dev tools and use this. And I'm going to kind of highlight some of these throughout our conversation today. So um, the first thing that we're going to do is create a package. So say you're starting the process and you want to create a package. Well, if you're just starting fresh and you don't already have a repo available to you with a package structure already developed, use this gives you this function called create package. Now create package, and I actually have a little typo here that I'm going to have to fix. Um, but basically when you use, when you do use this create package and put in a path to where you want to store those files, this function will actually just set up the entire directory structure for you. Okay. We'll set up the basic directory structure and it will create specific files that you'll need when you're going to be developing your package. Now, the big thing to consider before you run the, before you run this, the book really talks about, Hey, take some time to consider where these files are going to be placed. 
um, because obviously you don't want to dump, you know, a bunch of package files in an already being developed package. You don't want to put it in an area where you're not going to be able to find it. You don't want to place it in a project that you're already developing. So you want to take into consideration before you run this, you know, take some time to think about where is this going to dump all of my files. Here's some of the files that are going to be created once you run this function. Um, I'm not going to spend too much talking too much about each one of these because we're going to get to each one of them as we kind of work through this process. But I think some of the big ones that you need to be aware of is the description file. Uh, the description file basically provides us metadata about our packages. Um, you can access these description files. Um, basically, they're just going to give you basic information about the package. It's going to give you information on what are the dependencies for the specific package. It's going to give you information about just like a title, a general description. It's also going to provide things like, um, you know, said dependencies, but who are the authors, who are the maintainers, who are the creators, so on and so forth. Um, we'll talk a little bit about namespace files, but um, Basically, the, this file is uh, a file that pretty much is declares our functions that are going to be exported out to the uh, to users of our package. And there's a specific chapter that's devoted to the namespace file. But then the other thing that's going to be built that I want to highlight is the R directory. Uh, I pretty much call this the business end of your package because this is where you're going to be dumping all of your functions and your files. And so um, Pretty much what you're going to be doing is you'll be using a lot of files within your R folder, and it's going to hold a lot of those .R files to which you're going to generate your functions. Now, there's some other files that are built within here, which I'm not going to talk about, but just kind of be aware that once you run this, it's just going to create that general package structure for you. So this is a good opportunity before I swap over to the next topic here. What questions do people have? Comments? retorts on anything that I, I got wrong. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, so what the book kind of does is this chapter, what it really does is it kind of walks through the development of a specific package called the regex excite package. And so if you want access to this package, it's linked into the book and I'm actually going to go there right now. Um, <laughs> Right, this regex excite package is just kind of like a toy package generated from Jenny Bryan to kind of walk through the package development process to highlight how these functions actually work um, or some of the pretty much kind of like the general like development process. And so what I'm actually going to do today is I'm going to transition a little bit and talk about Git and GitHub about how to go from getting uh, how to kind of start off with a package that we already have in a repo that we want to clone down into our own um, source file so that we can actually work with to develop certain functions and stuff. And so I'm going to really kind of try and sprinkle in a little bit of GitHub discussion in here. I'm not going to deep dive on it, but I think it's kind of important because um, it's just kind of general knowledge to kind of have because it's also really good to um, consider about really getting uh, using version control, especially if you're going to be doing package development. But I already know from our previous conversation, some people are already familiar with it, so I don't want to bog down the entire conversation with, with uh, Git and GitHub. Oh, let's see here. So let me switch back to the chapter here. So let's just have a little brief kind of reduction or a brief, brief introduction to Git and GitHub here. And for people that are not familiar with this, um, concept is basically Git and GitHub are two separate tools that allow us to do a couple things and a, a lot of powerful things when we're doing package development or script development or project development. Now, this is the best way I kind of think of it. And, you know, uh, nobody yell at me because this is a very basic definition and I understand there's more power to these tools. But the first thing is I really kind of think of it as moving or kind of mirroring, mirroring certain files. And it's also a really good tool to help us track changes or to track changes to files that we may be working on or that we may be working on with in conjunction with a team. And so what's really nice about these tools is it helps us kind of mirror certain files. It helps us track changes as our team or as we're making changes to them throughout the development process. Uh, 
I know, again, nobody yell at me. This is, this is a very basic understanding of what I have, but this topic can certainly get more complex. There are a lot more tools that are available to you, especially if you um, are going beyond just using Git, but you're actually using GitHub or you're using Bitbucket or you're using GitLab. But just for people to kind of just wrap their minds around it, I just want to kind of give like a basic accessible definition of what these tools actually do. Now, big thing, remember there is a difference between Git and GitHub, Bitbucket and GitLab. Git is the actual version control system that you're using. GitHub, Bitbucket and GitLab are the ones that are the hosting services that are available to you to actually host your project files and everything that you have. Now, again, simplified discussion of that, simplified definition, but kind of gives you a sense of what it is. Um, really kind of the first thing that you have to do when you're getting started with Git and GitHub is setting up authentication. And honestly, uh, I can't spend an, I can't spend a ton of time talking about authentication because there's going to be differences in the type of authentication you want to do. There's going to be differences in the type of operating system you have and so on and so forth. So I really drive you to these three uh, are these two kind of places to go. Um, this vignette is actually in the use this package. And I think it does a really good job of kind of talking about how to get your GitHub credentials set up so that you can use the use this package to do um, your workflows to get in GitHub. I was actually surprised at how easy this was with the functions that they provide to you. Um, I mean, anytime that I have to do authentication, I always get this like little cringe because I've always had like bad experiences with authentication with stuff. And so, but when I first started reading this, I was like, ah, oh, okay, this is going to be a lot of, this is going to be a big hurdle, but I kind of did it in like maybe, you know, 30 minutes and I was up and running and I was able to do pretty much any Git operation in my console. So that was really cool. Um, so kudos to, uh, Kudos to the package creators of use this and, and this kind of documentation because it really, really helped. Um, a few reminders. Uh, then obviously the happy Git and GitHub for the use are is a great place to get some more in-depth information. The other thing that I do want to highly suggest is, is that if you're going to be using GitHub and, and uh, or Git and GitHub for version control is just choose a client. Um, I think a lot of people spend a lot of time getting scared about this specific topic because there's just so many clients available to you. Um, you can, you know, you can uh, you can use the built-in GitHub GitHub tab or the Git tab in our studio. So if you're unfamiliar with this, let's pop this up so you see it. There is a Git tab here. Uh, so if you look in near your environment tab, there's a Git tab here to kind of be more familiar with it. If you want to use the client through our studio, uh, there is, you know, the GitHub desktop app. Um, I've used the GitHub desktop app before. I kind of like it. Um, there's also the use this helper functions, which I'm going to kind of highlight a little bit today. So there is a bunch of functions from the use this package to help you interact with GitHub and Git. And then there's obviously the command line. Uh, and to be frank, I've I've gone to the command line. That's the way I interact with Git and GitHub. Um, and then I've actually started to use the GitHub command line client a lot more lately too. So that's been really helpful. Then I also today came across the GERT package. I think it's GERT. I don't know, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but the GERT package gives you the ability to do it's just a basic simple Git client that allows you to run Git operations in your console. So like a Git commit, Git add, Git push, so on and so forth. GERT is a great place to look. So um, just to kind of open up the conversation a little bit, what kind of Git clients do people use here or are people familiar with? Or do we have a bunch of command line people here? I use a desktop app. Uh, like yeah. Desktop. That's where I started. Like I really, that's where I started. And then as I got more comfortable with it, then I switched over to using like the command line. What else? Who else? Uh, I mostly use the RStudio Git pane. Sometimes if I'm, yep. Go ahead, sorry. 
if, uh, if I'm working on HTML text documents, uh, I'm using an Atom and they have a Git client there. Um, as of recently on the Windows machine is Visual Studio. Uh, if it's on the MacBook or Linux, choose the command line uh, directly. Um, if I'm in the RStudio session, it's RStudio. Um, I always find the GUI systems are a little bit lacking, uh, meaning click happy. Um, it's often more efficient or faster to drop and do it from command line, uh, but it, it, it'll work either way. Yeah, so anybody else? Uh, I'm still kind of developing my comfortability with Git and GitHub, but um, so I've mostly used the, the Git pane in our studio. Yesterday, going through this chapter, I did for the first time use something called uh, use GitHub instead of use Git, which I think is part of also the use this package, uh, which did flawlessly create a new repo on my GitHub without like it immediately just opened a new GitHub repo in a browser, which I thought was really impressive with one line of code. Um, still trying to figure out how I now actually push to that <laughs> repo instead of just committing to the Git that's been created locally. But um, so I'm figuring that out. But that's my that's what I've used. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and I was and today when I was playing around with it, that's where I was at, too. Like, um, because I was trying to figure out, because I know you could do it from the command line and everything, but use this doesn't have like for the basic Git operations, but this GERT package does provide it. And it, and use this actually wraps around some of these GERT functions. So you can do like the Git add, Git branch, Git push, all the basic Git commands. Um, I'll, I'll kind of walk through that a little bit today, but uh, I think it's GERT. I'm sorry for the package developers and maintainers if I'm calling it wrong, you know, tweet at me. I don't, you know, I don't know, do something to to slap me on the wrist, but I'm calling it GERT for right now. So, but this package provides for you the git add, git commit, you know, anything that you pretty much could do to work with, you know, as a git client. But really when it comes down to it, to be to be frank, like just choose one, you know, choose one and really learn it. Um, you know, there are people out there that they're just command line heavy and they're like, I'm just gonna use the command line. Hey, great. If that works for you, use it. If you're somebody that's a GUI person, great, use it. Um, you know, that's just basically where I'm at with that. It's just pick one. Uh, cool. So basically what we're going to kind of, what I'm going to kind of show you is I'm going to use this example regex excite package, and we're going to kind of go through this fork triangle and you uh, using some of these use this package functions to actually create a fork automatically and pull that stuff down locally onto my computer and then do the basic git add, git commit, git, git push, um, you know, as we make changes to this example package as we work through the chapters information. Uh, really what we're gonna do is we're gonna work through this kind of basic workflow. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this diagram. You can look at this yourself, but I, I created this for our mastering shiny book club to kind of talk about what a basic workflow will look like and what these Git commands would be to do this workflow. So if you have certain questions about, you know, what step or what stage you are, it's a great opportunity to see, okay, what command do I actually run to do this? And so, you know, there's, there's your files on GitHub. You do a Git clone or Git pull onto your local computer or your local environment. And then there's certain things that might be happening or questions that you have to which you can run certain commands to do. Now, when I say commands, those are what the GUI provides for you, right? And so if you look at these commands here and go, and I'm just going to pull up the, the Git tab here in our studio, you'll see that a lot of these, you know, a lot of these Git functions are already built into the GUI, you know, Git pull, Git push, commit, so on and so forth, branching, uh, switching your branch, so on and so forth. So pretty much anytime that you're using a GUI, you're basically just doing these, these Git commands. So but we're going to simplify this workflow. And I was legitimately blown away by this today. Um, so you have to go through the authentication step. And again, I've linked those materials up top. So if you want to, if you're interested in how this actually works, um, you have to authenticate first. And it's really easy. You just have to set up a um, GitHub token to actually uh, let, use this, let the use this package work on your behalf with the GitHub API. 
And so, but basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this one function in my console to pretty much create a fork of Jenny Bryan's regex excite package over into my GitHub account and actually clone it down onto my computer. So this is what I'm going to do here. So let's go to, I had a fresh session over here. Sorry, I don't mean to window people to death here. So, so all I'm going to do is I'm just going to paste this, this one function in here, and this will pretty much do all of the work for me. It will fork it for me and clone it down. And so um, I just run this. It's going to do all the stuff with the Git protocol. Hopefully it works. Uh, oh, whoa, okay. Desktop regex excite. Okay. Um, well, anyways, I thought that was going to work today, but it obviously did not. So error users exist. It's not an empty directory. Regex excite. Um, do I have a file of it already? Is it set as your working directory? Don't think so. I was having that problem before I set the same file I was trying, um, I believe. That okay. might be it. Oh, here, I could probably share the error and we can diagnose it here real quick, but users, see Berkey desktop. So I think I already have this file here. So actually, you know what? I know that's the issue. So bear with me here for a second while I dig through my files. So this is a great opportunity. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's the reason I had this file because I was playing around with it earlier. So I'm going to delete this. Uh, move the trash. All right. And that's kind of weird because I probably should set this up to not dump it into my, there's probably an option to set where you want to, what file directory you want to put this in. So I kind of haphazardly did this because I don't put anything into my desktop. Okay. Let's see if I can run it again. Ah. Success, here we go. So basically I run this one package and it's doing everything on my behalf. It's basically creating a clone. It's creating a fork for me and it creates a clone and it opens up a brand new session with all that information in it. Just straight magic. Like before I would used to have to go into the GitHub, go into GitHub online, do the fork myself, clone everything down to the command line because that's the way I do it. But I just run this one command with a few arguments done and it was really cool um so here's the example package that we're kind of working with and we're going to kind of work through this as we go through the chapter materials but i also came across when i was looking at the use this package that there are some functions to help with pull requests uh, i didn't get that far to see how these work but they help you manage your pull requests which basically meaning as I make changes to my forked repo in GitHub and, and you know make changes to it and say, I wanna send my changes for Jenny to review and potentially pull into her repo, there's some functions out there to help you manage that. So again, you can do this all from a GUI and a client, but since we're already talking about the use this package, it's just a great opportunity to highlight that there's a lot of functions that I'm just gonna say magic right now, just because I don't fully understand how they work because I looked at them just this afternoon, so. Um, okay, so I think what I'm gonna do, and if John, if you're watching, because I know John watches these sometimes later, I'm gonna try my best to just manage the book club, just using all of use this functions to kind of learn it. So I, it's just hard to break my command line habits. So, um, but anyways, so I'm gonna try my best. Uh, so we talked about that again, if you want to learn some more about how to manage pull requests using the use this package, there's going to be a vignette that's available to you that talks about the pull request helpers and I kind of read through this and it was interesting to see like all the stuff that you could potentially do to help with your pull requests um, for any fork repos that you have so. What questions do people have about the brief, brief introduction of Git, GitHub, the use this package to do Git or to do some of the Git operations um, for clone, forking and cloning. Okay, excellent. All right, so let's see here. So we're going to kind of talk about, okay, we're going to first kind of talk about one of the, one of the first things that the book talks about, some of the steps for actually creating a function. 
Use this provides for us a, a workflow function called use R. And what this basically does is it creates a file um, below the R subdirectory um, for our functions that we want to create for our package. So when it comes for us, uh, and if you're new to package development, each new function that you create when starting out should get its own file. Now, as your packages get more complex, there may be opportunities for you to put uh, more functions into a specific file or many different strategies that you want to do for your actual file management within your package as they get more complex. But if you're, if you're just starting out, one function, one file. Um, that will kind of help you kind of get things set up um, and kind of get your, get your mind wrapped around how the R directory works. Uh, there, when, you, when you're creating a package, you really want to try to avo avoid having other top level code um, in the, above this file. So really try to, to stick all of your function, well, you really should be sticking all of your functions in this R subdirectory. And so you really want to avoid, avoid um, you know, having, uh, having code that's not outside of that R subdirectory. Now, the other thing is, is when you're creating these files, we need to get away from using library in the function files. Um, the reason why we want to avoid library is because there's different mechanisms to which we'll talk about later when we get to, I think, ooh, what chapter do we talk about that? I think we talk about it in object documentation and we talk about it in namespace. And oh, we talk about it in description files too, um, package metadata. Um, there's different mechanisms to which we use to declare our dependencies. And in fact, there's also going to be more of a discussion of why we don't do that, because we don't want to um, change what's called the search path on our users um, on our users computer or our users our session. And so what we want to make sure that we're doing is, is that we don't want to use that library call in our, our files because there's other ways for us to manage our dependencies. So what we need to kind of change is our mindset of writing scripts into writing files for packages. And so there's certain conventions that you need to follow. You know, my general experience that I've had with packet with, you know, working with R is I've created scripts, right? Going from top to bottom, left to right, trying to go from point A to point B with my files. It's a different change to it now because now you're writing files to do specific um, tasks or solve a specific problem. And so you're no longer um, technically using like a script style. You're writing it for actual packages. And we'll talk more about that. The other thing that the book kind of mentions is this book doesn't cover how to write functions. Um, so if you're, if you're somebody who's still kind of learning how to use functions or create functions, check out the R4DS chapter. Uh, then also look at the functions chapter in advanced R. Um, there are also book clubs that have done R for DS that have uh, recorded sessions that talk about functions. So go check those out if you need to learn more about that. One thing that I'm trying to get better at is writing functions. And so does anybody here have any other resources that they've come across that they found to be helpful uh, to like learn how to create functions? Yeah, to be frank, like that's like one of the hardest things. Like, you know, I think kind of understanding how to like structure the package, you, know, you can wrap your mind around it. But like when you're writing functions, that's like where the work really happens because you, you think like, oh, this is going to be easy. And before you know it, you're like, oh, wait, I got to do this. I got to do this. Oh, how do I make this more complex? Or if you're one of those people who likes to kind of go dig into like dplyr or you like to go dig into other pack and functions, you're like, whoa, this is more than just beyond just a simple function. Um, I, I just I wish there were more resources that I knew of to learn how to write more complex functions. And so uh, I think it would kind of help me learn a little bit more if, you know, if anybody has any other resources that they know of, of how to create functions or how to create complex functions. but. I didn't know if anybody had any. Yeah, R4DS is a good one. Um, it gives you the, really the base, like base knowledge of what you need. I do agree with that. 
I just get kind of hung up. Like you read that chapter and you're like, oh, it's really simple. But then when you go read other people's like function definitions and what they write, you're like, whoa, maybe I really don't understand what's going on with this function here. And maybe that's, maybe that's a lack of knowledge and maybe that's just poor function writing. I, I don't know, but that's just where I come from. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to add a function to this regex excite package. Now, this is not a novel function. Uh, I'm sure somebody else has probably written a better implementation of this, but basically all this function does is it just creates a date file name. And so many of you are probably familiar with some of these functions here. They're all base R functions. But all I'm really going to do here is I'm creating a file name that has a date time attached to the front of it. So all I'm doing is I'm passing in a string, uh, you know, for my file name, and it's going to add a prefix for a date above it, right? So just a really simple function. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this to this regex excite package. So I'm going to go over here. So bear with me. So uh, gonna make sure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the use this package. And again, you can already, you could probably bring it in here with a library and attach it. Library, you, let's just do dev tools because it should bring in use this, which it does. And what I just do is just use R and then I give it a name, which I'm just gonna give it the function name, create date file name. Okay, when I, once I run this, Basically, it's going to do a couple things. It's going to set your active project to where you have your um, package set up. It's also going to create the file for you in the R pack in this R directory right here. And it's also going to give you a really nice reminder of use test. Now, we're not going to talk about, I don't know if we're going to get to testing today. We'll probably have to cover that next week a little bit. But it's a really nice reminder to run this function right here if you have a testing framework set up. And in fact, if you run this use test right here, right now, if it's going to use the active file name to create a test for you. So it's just a good reminder to create that test file. So really efficient, really fast, great reminder, great workflow to kind of kind of see, okay, yeah, okay, now I need to create a test, so on and so forth. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to take my function definition that I have, and I'm going to put it in this file and save it. And so what I have here is I, I have the function definition and I also have our Roxygen 2 skeleton, which is gonna be used for generating our documentation, which we'll talk about here in a second, okay? So now I have this function definition here. So once, if I wanna go and I wanna take a test drive of this function, I'm gonna use this other function from use this called load all, okay? Uh, sweet, sounds good, Larissa, awesome uh load all and basically load all is a convenience function uh convenience function in use this to uh kind of do a test drive of your functions it kind of mimics as if you were installing your package so if i wanted to now what i can do is i can do create date file name give it a file i'm just going to call it data.csv in this case and test out if the function's actually working, okay? Now, what I really like, and I thought this was a really nice touch with the load all, with the load all function, is it gives you a key binding in RStudio. If you're on a Mac, you can go shift command L and it will do a load all. Or if you're on a Windows, I think it's control shift L. But I think this is a really nice touch. If you're in your source file and you do that key binding, you'll notice that the cursor dumps you into your console. So you don't have to go to your mouse and switch. I just thought that was just a nice little touch to kind of speed things up a little bit. So um, if you're somebody who's like developing a function, learn that key binding because it will make things so much faster for you. Now, you know, if, if you're just starting out and you're like, okay, Colin, that's just a really minor thing. But if you kind of think about how much time you're actually doing the load all, making changes load all, that time starts compounding as you develop packages over and over. So it's just, I, I just, I'm just beaming with enthusiasm because it's like, that's just a nice little touch to make things a little bit easier. So, okay, cool. So we have our function, it actually works. Let's see where we're at with this here. So, 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about documentation here in a second, but we that's how you basically add a function. Um, so we did load all. I walked through that. Uh, the big thing to know about this is with this, this function technically does not exist as of yet. And in fact, if we do exists, whoops. No, Docker, I will not update you right now. Date, date, file name. This function, and let's do check in, in the global environment, where equals global environments does exist. Should be false. Oh, I gotta do inherits false, excuse me. Inherits equals false. Right, okay. So um, basically this function does not technically exist because we haven't technically installed it and attached it as of yet. And so it does not exist in our environment. So big thing to know about load all again is it's just a, an ability for you to test your functions to make sure that they're working. And so um, if you really, really wanna see if it is working as if the package was installed, you're going to want to actually install it and we'll talk more about how to mimic that running the install function here in a little bit okay so now that we've got a working function here this is probably a good opportunity for us to commit this um usually what i've what i've kind of come across with my team is commits are cheap so pretty much once you've created a working function you've documented commit it right away. I, I think that's just, you know, commits are cheap. Just commit as much, you know, commit whenever you have like a significant change that you make. So just do them whenever. So since we have um, GERT loaded in, what we can do is we can do uh, git, I think, GERT, okay, so git add. So what I can do here is I can add files through this. So if I do a git status, do a git status, you can see the files that I've changed here. Here's the file that I've added. Well, I've actually technically added two files because I've added a test file using use this, but say I only want to add this to my version control. I can copy this, do a git add, add this to my function, okay? And if, if you're a GUI person, you can see that um, basically this should change if I refresh it. Yes, it changed. And so now that I have it git add, I can add a git commit. Um, I'm gonna add a message. I'm gonna say add file or gate file name function. So I'm doing the git commit, just like as if I was doing here over here. And then now basically all I have to do is just do a git push, git push. And it's up, uh, uh, unexpected error, 403. Well, it looks like I have a, oh, so git push. I'm not sure why this is the case, but it looks like I'm getting a credentials error. Oh. You're, I think you're trying to push to Jenny's repository uh, and your sense. credentials don't match. That makes sense. Well, anyways, um, I just learned this this morning. So uh, just to kind of show you, that you can do this all from the command line using the use this package and the GERT package. Um, you can do all of these git commands basically from your command line. Again, you can still do it in your, in your um, GUI if you want. Uh, you can use it in another git client, but if you're someone who doesn't like to do context switching, learn them right here. It helps tremendously. So it, it's just good enough that I may get away from the command line through the terminal. Maybe, but anyways, that's just me. So I'm, I'm stubborn in, in some areas, so. Um, okay, cool. So that's taking a function for a test drive. Uh, so let's, let's just check if our packages or if our functions are actually working. Um, so the first one that the book talks about is this, um, uh, the check function. Uh, there is a key binding for this too as well. It's gonna be your shift command E uh, key binding. My Windows people, it's going to be Control Command E. But what this is going to do is it's going to run the R command check. And uh, again, I'm not totally familiar because I've never submitted to CRAN, but I understand that this is like a standardized check that CRAN runs to ensure your package meets the standards 
of CRAN. Somebody please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, basically, you want to run this and read the output because the output is going to give you some things that could potentially be wrong with your package that you do want to address. And if this is going to be a package that you're going to submit to CRAN, you're going to have to address those issues. And so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run that command check here. You can do it two ways. You can go to this build tab over here. And for people that are not totally familiar with RStudio, my setup might be a little bit different. I like my console up here on the top right. The default feature is the consoles here in the, in the bottom left. So these two things might be swapped. Just understand that your build tab is right next to your environment tab. But there's this check button right here. You can run check here. You can also see that the key binding is up here as well. The shift command E. I'm just going to run the key, key binding because it's faster. You'll see all of this output get the, that gets outputted. Again, this is the R command check. I'm not 100% familiar of all the things that this is checking for, you know, because I'm just I'm just starting out with this and I've never submitted to CRAN. But does anybody in the group have any experience on what the R command check does or the common things that it checks for? It checks that it can run all the examples in docs and builds the vignettes and can install it on the system and like don't doesn't have like dependencies that weren't called and stuff like that to the whole lot, but takes ages sometimes. Yeah, thanks, Rex. Um, yeah, so uh Rex brings up a couple uh, good points. Like it's gonna run your examples. So you'll notice in my function here, I have my example here. It's gonna run this. Um, it's also going to check your vignettes and we haven't talked about vignettes, but those are our, it's going to be long form documentation that gets sent with the package. Um, it's going to check to make sure that it's has, uh, ASC two characters, I think is what it checks. Um, it, it does all kinds of things. Um, but anybody else have anything to add as well about the R command check? I probably should read through this sometime. I just usually look for what's wrong. I know that's probably a slap on the wrist. And if I do submit something to CRAN, I probably should, you know, really be paying attention to it. Um, but the other thing that it does, it also will do is if you have formalized tests in your package, it will run your tests as well. It will run your tests along with the R command check. Um, the best way that I can think about this is this is providing you feedback, right? So um, anytime that you run our command check, you're going to get immediate feedback on what could potentially be wrong with your package. So a good thing to, to consider with this is deal with problems early and often. Uh, fix it now, not later. You know, I, you know, I, I'm at fault here as well. You know, sometimes I get lazy. I'll run the check and there's problems. I'm like, eh, you know, I'll just let it sit for a couple of weeks. And then I have a team working on it, they work on it, and then just the problem compounds. And then before you know it, I'm spending a day trying to figure out, okay, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? Okay, this is getting messed up here. So it's really good to run this check and run your tests continually because don't let your work pile up. It's really harder to fix when problems accumulate. And uh, just to kind of give you like a little bit of a story, like probably about like two years ago, we developed like a package to use at work. And, you know, I never, we didn't really understand the R command check and we never ran it. And now we wanted to like revamp it and use it. And then I learned about the R command check and I started running it and it's just error, error, error. And I'm just sitting there, I'm just like, okay. So I spent about three, four days just trying to debug just to get the R command check to work again. Now, if I would have been smart or if I have a time machine that I could go back in time and tell myself, hey, this is an important thing to take into consideration. Uh, I probably would have ran it a lot more. So for the group here, you're forewarned. Just run the R command check, save yourself some time um, because it will highlight things that are wrong. Um, cool. The other thing is package metadata. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this because there's an entire chapter devoted to the description. So, um, but basically this is just package metadata that you can access giving you information about what the package is, what the title is, who are the maintainers, description, licensing, so on and so forth. Um, also dependencies as well for it. 
Uh, licensing, I'm not a lawyer. Um, consult your legal departments on this. Um, you know, for personal packages, licensing is not too much of a concern. Again, I'm not a lawyer, so it might be a concern for your own personal packages, but uh, you know, I'm, I don't know. Uh, but if you do develop a public facing package, so something that you're gonna to submit to CRAN, licensing becomes more important. And so make sure that you have take into consideration what are the implications of the licensing that you choose. But the book really just says, as you're getting started out, just pick one, um, you know, and I'm not informed enough to really give you a heads up on it, on which one to choose. But the book just says, just pick one for now. Uh, there is a convenience function, this use this, um, whatever licensing you want to use, just run this function, it will set up your licensing for you. Um, again, disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, talk to your legal departments. There you go. Um, this might be the last thing I can cover for today. Um, and then we'll cover the rest of this and get into system setup and packet structure next week. But documenting functions. So um, Fox, our functions are documented using LaTeX. Am I right? Am I wrong on the pronunciation of that? I've heard it pronounced LaTeX. I've heard LaTeX. Does anybody have a firm stance on where the pronunciation? I feel like I hear LaTeX more about or latex but i'm not sure which is technically correct in grad school for me it was latex but as i've kind of dug into the depths of the internet i've heard it called latex so i don't know anyways sidebar pretty much um our our function objects and things within our package are going to be um using a kind of like latex style um way to kind of write our documentation. Uh, all of our documentation that gets created is going to be created or going to be converted into .rd files and get placed within what's called the man directory. Um, and basically, we we don't set up or we don't manually set up the documentation. We let Roxygen2 do all that heavy lifting. And how Roxygen2 does all that hef heavy lifting is it uses the Roxygen skeleton like this with different tags known as directives to do certain things to that specific documentation. Big thing to note is that Roxygen 2 skeletons uh, start off with comment lines that use the hashtag or pound, depending on whatever you want to call that, um, and then the single quotation. Uh, once, once you create your documentation, then you're going to run document. There is a key binding for this. So shift command D, uh, control command D for um, Windows people. And what it's going to do is it's going to take these Roxygen skeletons for your functions or your objects within your package and then transition all of your files into what are called RD files and then dump them into the man directory. Um, the big thing to know is, is that when you do run document, this is draft documentation. So if you do have any links between functions, they won't work at that at that point until you install the package. So here's the last example that I'll share with you. I do have some documentation here. If I do, I'm just going to do the key binding document. It's going to run this. You'll notice that if I go over into this man folder here, it's created this RD file using that kind of LaTeX um, syntax to create it. And so where does this show up? Uh, if you document it and do the question mark, when I name my file create, this is a long, this is a long function name. So sorry, probably should have thought about that a little bit more. But you can see that now this um, this RD file gets transitioned into, I think, HTML. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but it gets converted into HTML for the documentation here. So Anytime that you run this question mark for any function, I'm going to do dplyr or filter. That's basically what you're accessing is you're converting that RD file into HTML. I think somebody correct me if I'm wrong, and it gets rendered here in your help viewer. So I'm already one minute over, um, but what questions do people have about to where we got with our 
with our functions and what we've talked about so far. All right, cool. Uh, well, we have a couple more things to cover. I think I'll be able to get through the rest of these in about 10, maybe 15 minutes. The rest of them are pretty straightforward. Um, but if anybody wants to take chapter three, um, just let me know. You can fill out, you can reach out to me through Slack or you can add your name to that sign up sheet if you want. Um, and then we'll finish up chapter two and then talk about, you know, pit, getting through three and then maybe starting the conversation of four next week. So other than that, if anybody's got any questions, want to hang out, let me know. But other than that, have a good rest of your night. Hey, Colin. Yeah, what's up? Or uh, in your schedule, uh, or I don't know if you or John put this together, the schedule is listing chapters three and four together as one uh, uh, presentation. Uh, is do you I can prepare for next week if that would help. Yeah, that'd be much appreciated. I mean, if you're if you're up for it, like go for it. Um, it's I, I don't know if we've got enough time in one hour with finishing chapter two and then starting three and four. Um, yeah. I can I can touch on that. We'll see where that takes us, but um, that'll give Rex an opportunity for chapter five the following week after. Yeah, I think that would be awesome. Um, okay. I think that'd be awesome if you could do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you okay. can, yeah, I don't, I can't remember, I can't remember how long system setup is. So yeah, but if we can maybe start the conversation of four, that'd be great. If not, if we just Agreed. get through three, that's good too. So, okay. Um, cause I have maybe about 10 to 15 minutes left, really most of the stuff we're going to talk about again. So I won't be spending a lot of time on it. So my get conversation went a little bit longer than I wanted to because it's just such an exciting topic, you know? <laughs> um, cool. Yeah. So if anybody wants to take three or four, um, like, like you said, Ryan, if you want to take that, just sign up for that and then I'll add you to the list. And then I think Rex, you wanted to take five, I think. Yeah. So Rex will take number five. So, but you know, other people are willing or available to do that. So. But that's all I have for you. So what other questions do people have? Concerns? Did I get anything wrong so far? I think I think like this first, this this chapter two is just like, this is all you need to know. You know, like this is all the stuff you're gonna cover. And we're gonna dive into it into more detail. So if it's like something that we kind of blaze through, we will come back to it. So it's not like you had to get it all in chapter two because each chapter is going to like deep dive into it. So cool. Well, I got to head out. So uh, if anybody has any questions, just shoot me a question in the Slack. Other than that, I'll look forward to seeing everybody next week. Thanks, Thanks, Thank you. Hey, Hi, everyone. See you next week.